School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. Spin a globe to Northwest Africa and put your finger on Western Sahara. What you'll see looks like an independent country. Western Sahara is, after all, nearly as big as its, as its northern neighbor, Morocco. In truth, this stretch of desert along the Atlantic Ocean may be Africa's most overlooked territorial dispute. Morocco seized control of most of Western Sahara in 1976. That followed the departure of the former colonial power, Spain. Morocco calls the territory its southern provinces, but no other nation officially recognizes Morocco's claim, and human rights violations within the ungoverned territory are rampant. Now, however, the world's attention is increasingly drawn to the decades-long dispute between Morocco and the Algerian-backed Polisario Front. The focus follows the French military intervention this year in Mali, which is two countries to the east from Western Sahara. The UN General Secretary and the French President both express fear that the rise of Islamic militancy in Mali could spread to the Western Sahara territory. Actually, as our guests on today's program will explain, the people in the ungoverned region practice a liberal form of Islam, and its refugee camps are led by women. Today on Global Journalist, the Western Sahara predicament. But first, World Watch. Syria's civil war returned to the forefront of public debate after evidence emerged that chemical weapons were used there. U.S. President Barack Obama had previously called the use of chemical weapons a red line. So the discovery raised the possibility of Western military intervention. Obama earlier this week remained neutral. He said it's still unknown how the chemical weapons were used, when they were used, and who used them. On Wednesday, health officials in Turkey said they're testing blood samples taken from Syrian casualties brought over the border from fighting in recent days. They're trying to determine whether they were victims of a chemical weapons attack. Western governments are wary of the false intelligence that was used to justify the 2003 war in Iraq, and Obama wants proof before taking action. Another hot spot Libya is flaring up again. A group of gunmen took over Libya's foreign ministry over the weekend. They blockaded the building with heavily armed trucks, and they're demanding that officials connected to the Gaddafi regime be banned from government jobs. The Justice Ministry was similarly surrounded on Tuesday, and other institutions, including the media, have been targeted. In Iran, oil sanctions imposed last year are eating into oil profits. The Financial Times reports that revenues tumbled to a three-year low. Iran is trying to counter the decline in its exports by raising oil prices. That strategy has effectively raised consumer gas prices in Asia and Europe. On the diplomatic front, President Vladimir Putin and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe held the first summit between their nations in a decade. They announced at the Kremlin that negotiations on a peace treaty will so resume soon. The lingering World War II dispute over a group of islands has stood in the way of a formal peace pact. In Venezuela, tensions over the re recent presidential election remain high. Demonstrations in the tens of thousands filled streets in the capital at midweek. There were marches by supporters of Nicolas Maduro and his mentor, the late President Hugo Chavez. At the same time, opposition candidate Enrique Capriles walked in a crowd of his supporters. The previous day, several opposition lawmakers were injured during a brawl on the floor of Congress. Caprilius called for an end to the government crackdown on his backers, and he reiterated plans to challenge his narrow election loss in both Venezuela's court and eventually appeal to the international justice system. Elsewhere in South America, the Bolivian Constitutional Court declared that President Evo Morales can run for a third term next year. The court said Bolivia's 2009 constitution that allows for just one single re-election doesn't apply to Morales' first term. That's because the first election in 2005 was before the constitution was enacted, but opposition leaders questioned the court's independence. In the Netherlands, Queen Beatrix stepped down from her throne, and her eldest son, Willem Alexander, was sworn in king. Willem is the first male to have the throne in more than 120 years in the Netherlands. The new monarchy is expected to be a little more laid back compared to its predecessors. The king has already announced that he should no longer be called Your Majesty. 
Finally, the president of Botswana was attacked, but it had nothing to do with politics. A cheetah slashed President Ian Kama in the face, and the wound required stitches. The president's bodyguard says the attack happened so fast it caught them both by surprise. That's it for World Watch. On our program today, to enlighten us about the situation in Western Sahara, our journalist Louise de Vega and Stephen Zunis, a University of San Francisco professor of politics and international studies. Luis de Vega is a Spanish newspaper reporter who was working as a correspondent in Morocco before the government banished him for his hard-hitting reporting. Stephen Zunis is the co-author of a book on Western Sahara. Welcome to Global Journalist. It's great to be on. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get up to date with the recent developments. The UN Security Council voted unanimously seven days ago to keep a peacekeeping force in Western Sahara. But Stephen, the Security Council declined to require human rights monitoring in the disputed territory. So, so what happened? Well, this is very disappointing. Minerso is the, the, the only peacekeeping force in the entire world uh, that does not have a human rights mandate uh, in terms of monitoring uh, what goes on in the area they are supposed to be uh, in, in charge of. And uh, there have been periodic attempts to try to rectify that. And there was some real hope this time because the Obama administration, in a break from previous administrations, both Republican and Democrat, uh, announced that they would propose a resolution that would renew uh, or so for the next six months and include this time a human rights mandate. But unfortunately, a combination of pressure from France, uh, which is Morocco's closest ally, uh, Morocco itself, which canceled a long-planned uh, military, joint military exercise with U.S. forces, as well as pro-Moroccan elements within Congress and the State Department, uh, forced Obama to back off on this. And they went ahead and renewed the mandate so once again, uh, without a um, right. human rights monitoring function. Okay. And, and Luis, there was a pro-independence protest last weekend in Western Sahara's largest city. Uh, could you tell us what happened? Well, what we have seen is that uh, Sahrawi people uh, feel uh, really tired of all that has happened in the last uh, year, mm -hmm. so they have seen a mission uh, on the ground, uh, the Minurso, who is who has not to war on 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 a war. There is no war. They are not shooting. They are not the uh, Polisario on Morocco are not fighting now. And at the same time, the Minurso is not working to prepare the referendum. So at least they were expecting uh, the Security Council to uh, order the Minurso to check to to monitorize. Uh, the human rights. So finally, the, the Minurso uh, has been extended to be on the ground until 2014, but uh, without, uh, they, they don't have to check the, 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 the human rights. Because of this, uh, hundreds of people, essentially in the capital, El Ayun, but also in another city, such Bojador, started uh, Thursday night and Friday last week. Uh, Different rallies uh, to, to demand uh, more attention from the uh, international community and to uh, express they, 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 they hope to, to, to be independent. So, as, as usual, the, the, the Moroccans uh, repress all these uh, rallies. And even today, five, six days uh, after, there are still uh, protests in, the, in different cities. And we have uh, dozens of people hurt in, in different hospitals, and there is uh, official uh, communicate from the Moroccan government telling that uh, at least 70 policemen from their side have been hurt uh, as well. Wow, so there, that's a pretty violent uh, conflict. So there, the Moroccan police came in and, and uh, uh, broke up the demonstrations? Well, uh, this is what, uh, what, what happens uh, very often. Uh, all, all this kind of, uh, of rallies in the streets has, has been taking place for, for, for a long time, even in the, in, in the, in, 
the years of, of Spain, uh, I mean before the Green March in uh, 1975, but uh, I don't know how to explain it in English. It is uh, like a pendulum, which is just go and back. So we had uh, in 2005 what we, what we call the, the Sahara Will Intifada, Mm -hmm. uh, that was a very hard uh, year, and from time to time we have people they going out to the street and showing the, their hope to to be independent and demanding at the same time not only uh, for the human rights but also uh, to press the the United Nations to to organize the, the referendum in which uh, the Sahrawis can decide uh, which is going to be their future. Right. Well, I want to get back to the conditions on the ground, but I also want to take a step back now and provide some historical perspective. Uh, Stephen, the uh, subtitle of, uh, of the book on Western Sahara is a War, Nationalism, and Conflict, Conflict Irresolution. And that kind of sums up uh, uh, what's going on. Could you give us some of the key plot points? Well, the main problem is that um, uh, Morocco uh, has powerful friends including France and the United States, uh, which are permanent members of the UN Security Council, which have the veto power, uh, which means that the, um, uh, there's a whole, the whole series of UN Security Council resolutions initially insisting that uh, uh, Morocco withdraw its occupation forces uh, that they brought into the country in, during their 1975 invasion, and more spent um, resolutions calling on Morocco to uh, allow for a free and fair referendum, uh, they, they haven't been enforced. And uh, it, it's quite disturbing because, you know, there are a lot of complex um, uh, conflicts around the world in dealing with ethnicity and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a clear-cut case of aggression. This is a case of a, a non-self-governing territory that denied its right to self-determination that have been invaded and occupied by a powerful neighbor. And, uh -huh. you know, if the, if the international community cannot uh, re, um, take, take the appropriate action in something as clear-cut as this, how can we expect to um, uh, deal with the more complex issues? Right. Uh, this is, um, and so really, it, it, it's, it's um, so far been a, a triumph of real policy, of uh, might makes right, regardless of international law or uh, even the most basic standards of, of, of human rights. The good news, though, and I think the, the only hope we really have, is both the ongoing resistance of the people of Western Sahara, who um, mostly nonviolently, uh, but at least uh, without arms, have um, been struggling in, in recent years uh, to, uh, you know, within the territory to uh, uh, try to get their basic rights, uh, including the right of self-determination, and a growing movement, particularly in Europe, we're starting to see uh, more elsewhere as well, of, of civil society organizations uh, really pressing their governments to change their support for the Moroccan occupation. This is what eventually freed East Timor, uh, the um, former Portuguese colony that was occupied by Indonesia for so many years. Uh, and, 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 and so I really think the only real hope we have is uh, global civil society. Right. And... Uh Luis, you're heading to the region uh, next week. Uh, why? Why now? Well, uh, I I try to go uh, every time I have the possibility. So next week, uh, the Polisario Front uh, is organizing an agenda in, uh, because of uh, the 40th anniversary of its foundation. Uh, you know, the Polisario Front is uh, a political organization, uh, uh, the Sahrawi government, we can call it, and right. it's uh, based essentially in the part of the Western Sahara that is under the control of the Sahrawis, and also in the refugee camps of Tindouf in the south of Algeria. The Polisario Front uh, has uh, a the main issue is to, to press for the independence of the territory. And even as uh, the president, Mohamed Abdelaziz, has recognized me several times, uh, independence is even before democracy. So uh, some people uh, from Morocco and other countries are 
uh, accusing the Polisario Front not to be a, 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 a democracy organization, but Abdullah Siz and the, the ministers of the Polisario were recognized that, first of all, is independence and then democracy. So um, I think a lot of young people from the Sahrawi camps are far from the government, and this can be in the, in the next future a problem to organize uh, the, 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 the agenda for the Polisario. So I, I want to see the next week in the ground mm-hmm. if, uh, is there something change, changing inside of the Polisario? Because I'm afraid with Abdel Aziz uh, being president for more than 30 years, it's not an image that's that something is changing in the country. And I want I want to get people to c- kind of visualize what, what the this, this situation there is. Uh, Stephen, can you talk about the, the divisions within the w- within the country where you have the uh, where Morocco has control, where where the uh, the occupied region, where uh, the uh, Polisario Front um, is, is basically running things, and then the refugee camps. Uh, and now the Sahawahari. People settled in this region generations ago, and now they're they're scattered. So, what's it like there now? You've been there several times. Well, the Sahrawis have just traditionally been a nomadic, and uh, they've uh, never wanted any kind of outside control. Uh, they, they were never part of the Ottoman Empire. They're virtually a free people, and even in Morocco during the height of its empire in the 19th century, never really controlled the territory, and the, and the Spaniards who had laid claim to that uh, area for a long time, uh, only attacked by the interior in the late 1950s. Uh, so they, uh, they really, um, uh, so, so their, 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 um, their history of resistance uh, to foreign domination is very much in their blood. When the mm-hmm. Moroccans invaded in 1975, uh, they were so brutal that nearly half the population fled and ended up in uh, refugee camps just across the border in uh, Algeria. And the armed struggle that the Polisario um, uh, waged uh, against the Moroccans succeeded uh, within uh, seven years of uh, liberating uh, close to uh, 85% of the territory. So thanks to massive uh, American and French uh, rearmament and training, including the presence of the special forces in the occupied territory itself, the uh, Moroccans were able to reverse the tide of the war, and by building a, a this giant uh, you know, separation wall, essentially this 1,200-mile um, uh, 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 pair of uh, uh, sand berms uh, in the desert, they uh, basically um, for, uh, forced the Palestario mm-hmm. to uh, out to only about uh, 20% of the uh, westernmost uh, parts of the, or the easternmost parts of the country where there's virtually um, no, no towns or, or natural resources or anything right. like that. Now, Luis, when people hear about th- this occupied territory, I mean, it sounds a little bit like a combination of the, the, the Berlin Wall and the West Bank, but, uh, but there's probably a better analogy, isn't there? Uh, maybe East Timor? I have never been in, in Asia in East Timor, but I have, I have been at about 20 times in Western Sahara, and what, what, what you see, not only in the ground, but also outside, is that uh, one of these kind of forgotten conflicts we, we have in, in the wall. Uh, now, uh, on the ground, in, inside of the, of the Western Sahara controlled and occupied by Morocco, but, but by Morocco, you see that uh, the population is, more today, today more settlers than uh, what we can say Sahrawis. Uh, in the last 20, 30 years, Rabat has, has pushed a lot of people to, 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 to go to live uh, in, in Western Sahara. So they, even if they make both sides, Sahrawis and Moroccan separate lives, and um, if there are some Sahrawi people supporting Rabat in the conflict, uh, you can see a lot of police and a lot of them in plain clothes in, in the street. And the situation in the normal life uh, is, is not really calm, uh, yeah. usually. So, but 
at the same time, there, there are not too many people being killed in this conflict. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are no petroleum. Uh, it's not in a region. Well, now we have a Mali conflict, but usually it's not in a region like uh, Middle East, uh, really very hot. So these are mm-hmm. some points that make an uh, international community not to focus the attention of what is happening in, in Western Sahara. But we have that the Sahrawis are supported by the law and the United Nations resolutions. But at the same time, uh, countries like Spain and the United States uh, and France, they don't want change, uh, things to change in the region. So they, they don't know how to, to, to finish a conflict in which the Sahrawis have the reason of the law, but at the same time, they, they, don't, they don't want to, to be angry with Morocco and to have any country in the region. Speaking of the international scope, how realistic are concerns that the conflict uh, in Mali uh, will spill over to the Western Sahara? Stephen? Uh, well, the threat from Al-Qaeda and Maghreb is real uh, yeah. in terms of um, in Mali, uh, southern Algeria, uh, Niger, uh, perhaps uh, Mauritania. I think Western Sahara is one place I think that's relatively safe uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, the um, Polisario has always been a uh, decidedly secular uh, and left the center uh, kind of uh, liberation movement. Um, and uh, they, they control the camps pretty thoroughly. Uh, they, if, if there was any Al Qaeda type infiltration, they would uh, find out about it uh, pretty soon and root it out. The other thing is that um, the uh, area where the G camps are are in a um, military zone for the mm-hmm. Algerian government, and the Algerians, of course, uh, had this bloody civil war in the 1990s against Islamist extremists, and they would certainly uh, not allow the penetration of those kinds of kinds of groups. But I think more fundamentally, uh, the um, the Sahrawi, uh, while you know, devoutly Muslim, have traditionally practiced a um, fairly uh, liberal kind of Islam. Uh, that um, would uh, is just the antithesis of the uh, really hard for you know, Salafist, misogynist, violent mm-hmm. kind of uh, uh, interpretation of Islam we normally associate with um, Al Qaeda and similar groups. Okay, and Louise, what's your perspective on the uh, pr- uh, possibility of a, a rise in Islamic militancy within Western Sahara or even the refugee area? Okay. Uh, for the first time in 2011, October 2011, a terrorist group, not officially Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, but another another group very very close to to ACME, uh, they they made three hostages, three workers for an NGO, two Spanish and one Italian, on the on the refugee camps in Tunis. It was 2011 for the first time. So. The, the, the reality is that uh, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb is a very big octopus growing in all along the, the, the desert, uh, not only in Algeria, but Mauritania, uh, Morocco, Western Sahara, Mali, Chad, uh, Niger, Tunisia, Libya. So uh, we cannot say that uh, the Western Sahara is an island in the north of Africa. So it's, it's, it's being affected directly uh, mm-hmm. by the conflict and the, the, the jihad and the terrorism. So uh, what is happening now is that uh, the solution that uh, Morocco and Spain and France and, and the United States are looking for is first of all uh, not to be affected uh, by the, 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 the security and the, and the terrorism. So. Uh, the, the, the goal of um, the development of, of uh, Al Qaeda in the region is, is, I think, is helping Rabat because no, nobody wants to, to talk now about a solution of the conflict in Western Sahara. But the first issue now is to calm down yeah. uh, the situation in the region and to fight uh, against terrorism. Okay. Now, before I, we wrap up the program, I want to remind everyone that uh, you can listen to this. Uh, program anytime by downloading our podcasts from the website globaljournalist.org. Our website now features a Western Sahara timeline, profiles, and a compilation of social media components about the dispute. 
So please send us questions or comments via globaljournalist at kbi.org or our Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at globaljourn. Uh, and finally, uh, Louisa, your closing comment on, on what makes these people uh, different uh, than, it's, than, than the other people in the area and, and what, uh, what your, your hopes are for them. I think we have to respect the laws. Yes. And the, the rules of the match are not uh, being respected okay. nowadays. Okay. Because uh, lots of people want to, 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 to win with an, uh, uh, I don't know how to just say in English, but, you know, if, if we are set to, to play the match under the United Nations, we have to respect. Right. And a lot of people is not respecting the, the, the rules, the resolutions, so the, the referendum should be organized. Because of this, I think it's, it's not the point who are the Sahrawis. The problem is... Uh, uh, what can we do to to to, to reach a, a, a fair solution? Okay. Thank you so much for for joining us today. It's been a very in, enlightening uh, conversation about a, a real international predicament. Now, Global Journalist is produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Our program is directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers. Raymond Tungakar is our executive producer. Sravani Pair was our lead producer for this program with assistance from Nassim Benchaban, Eliza Lopez Aguado, and Ali McIntyre. Stay with us for Free Press Watch, and please join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. And now, Free Press Watch, Global Journalist's weekly rundown of the major events affecting press freedom around the world. I'm Nassim Benchaban. The news this week comes from the New York Times, Reporters Without Borders, the Committee to Protect Journalists, Freedom House, CNN, and the BBC. Iraqi government officials pulled the operating licenses of 10 television stations, including Al Jazeera, after accusing the networks of contributing to growing sectarian violence in the country. Sunni-led unrest and turmoil resulted in about 180 deaths in the previous week after Shiite-led government forces violently cracked down on Sunni protesters in the city of Hawija, killing 23 people. The Iraqi Communication and Media Commission said the networks had, quote, exaggerated things, given misinformation, and called for breaking the law and attacking Iraqi security forces. The suspensions appear to target mainly Sunni television networks critical of Iraq's government and Shiite Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. American filmmaker Timothy Tracy was arrested by Venezuelan authorities and accused of working for U.S. intelligence services. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro ordered the detention of Tracy, who arrived in the country two years prior to document the political situation. Interior Minister Miguel Rodriguez Torres said he had video footage shot by Tracy that shows the filmmaker taking part in violent protests after the presidential election. Tracy will face terrorism charges at a court hearing May 3rd. Authorities in Kazakhstan seized copies of a new opposition newspaper before it could be distributed on April 24th. The inaugural issue of the paper, titled The Truthful Newspaper, contained an interview with the country's Communist Party leader and pieces from a book about an opposition figure. The newspaper plans to attempt publication again next month. For more information on these stories and other issues concerning press freedom around the world, please visit our website at globaljournalist.org. Thank you for joining us this week on Global Journalist. I'm Nassim Ben-Shabban. We'll see you next week.